Hello everybody, uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And a special welcome to all of us who are joining, uh, all of you who are joining us tonight, but especially to those of you who are joining us from overseas because we have a particularly large overseas contingent and in particular from Australia's near abroad. Um, and in particular from the Philippines. So if you like what you see here, uh, do uh, please check out uh, the Australian Institute of International Affairs website. And if you like what you see there, come back for more. We hold several webinars per week um, and you can find them on internationalaffairs.org.au forward slash events. So to let you know what our mission is, we're we're here to help, I need to get my iPad. <laughs> help people in Australia know, understand, and engage more in international affairs. But we're a welcoming bunch, so you don't have to be in Australia to join us. So today's event um, is a co-sponsored event by the Australian Institute of International Affairs and the C Crawford Fund an Australian registered charity which highlights benefits to Australia and developing countries um, of research for agriculture and development. And I'm pleased to acknowledge that we have in the audience uh, Dr. Colin Chartres, the CEO of the Crawford Fund. Um, and we also have some other notables, uh, Professor Andrew Campbell, the CEO of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, and Dr. Mark Shipp, the Chief Veterinary Officer of, of Australia from the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So today's, to today's topic, um, today's topic is of course food security and food security is central to the situation we find ourselves in with COVID. Uh, not only can we point to the origins of the disease as related to um, unsanitary conditions involving food, we can also point to the fact that the pandemic is likely to disrupt um, food distribution networks. Um, and that means that in, particularly in poorer countries of the world, there may well be food shortages. Now, Australia is a country that can offer insight and assistance in this regard with world-class agricultural research. We can aid and strengthen animal, plant and environmental and human health regimes through an initiative known as One Health. And to talk about that initiative and food security in general um, and what it means for the region, uh, I'm joined by our three esteemed experts today. So the first, um, and I'll, I'll introduce all of the experts now, so we don't have to do it in turn um, as they're speaking. The first I'd like to introduce is the Honorable John Anderson. He's the chair of the Crawford Fund, and he's also the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia and leader of the National Party. He was the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, the Minister for Transport and Regional Development, and he served on um, the Expenditure Review Committee, the National uh, Security Committee, and the Standing, Committee, uh, Standing Environment Committee while in Cabinet. Hi, John. Nice to have you with us. Good to be with you, Bryce. Uh, we also have Dr. Stephanie Williams, who's Australia's Ambassador for Regional Health Security. Uh, she was appointed to that position in March this year. She is a public health physician and epidemiologist who has been DFAT's principal health specialist since 2017. Prior to joining DFAT, she was a medical advisor in the Office of Health Protection in the Australian Government Department of Health. She was the public registrar for Victoria's chief health officer. She was an epidemiologist in global health for the World Health Organization. And she was a medical doctor for Médecins Sans Frontières and the WHO. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, we also have Dr. Anna O'Kello, who is uh, the Research Program Manager of Livestock Systems at the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. She is also a commissioner on the Lancet One Health Commission, which considers how contemporary global health challenges are implicated within the complex interconnectedness of humans, animals, and our shared environment. 
She's a trained veterinarian. She has a PhD in political science as well um, in global health policy at the University of Edinburgh's Center for African Studies. And she worked for international NGOs, the Australian government, the World Health Organization, and the University of Edinburgh. She's also an adjunct at Edinburgh's Global Health Academy. So without further ado, I shall pass things over to John. John, you have the floor. Well, Bryce, thank you, and uh, thank you to those who have joined us. Can I begin with a couple of positives? One is that I think it's important to recognise the enormous progress that's been made in lifting people out of poverty globally, uh, and indeed agricultural research and application or extension have been a major part of that. Uh, so uh, you've seen vastly improved outcomes in terms of uh, nutrition, in terms of longevity, in terms of opportunities for people uh, right across the world as a result uh, of a whole series of things, uh, medical research, uh, I would think better governance as a general statement, although we might be concerned about the retreat of democracy in some quarters of the world at the moment, uh, and uh, a return to a less stable world, which is very important to remember in the context of going forward and learning the lessons out of COVID, which in many ways I think represents an acceleration of history on many fronts. Uh, I think it's also encouraging to me, and as some source of pride, that Australian agricultural research is generally recognised to be cutting edge. We farm and graze animals in a difficult uh, environmental environment, uh, uh, situation. Uh, I think that's been acknowledged for a long time. Uh, research is second to none. Productivity is very high as a result of it. And we've been able to do a great deal internationally. And ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, with whom Crawford you know, really partners, I suppose it would be the best way to put it, might be seen as one of the heavy hitters globally, um, along with the United States uh, and various other countries that are really serious contributors in terms of agricultural research and know-how, not only for their own benefit, but globally. Uh, interesting, uh, amongst the big seven, uh, Six Nations and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because Bill Gates himself believes that the work of groups like ACI is the best way to lift people out of poverty and give them more opportunities. So uh, then let's come to the negatives. One is that in perhaps a social media age, there's an inclination for people to focus on the highlighted issues of the time. And it's interesting to note that at the World Economic Forum, supposedly the gathering of the world's cleverest economists, the people who lead uh, governments and uh, the business community and so forth across the world, uh, earlier this year in January, focused overwhelmingly on climate change. It's not to say that that's not an important issue. My point is to highlight the fact that there are many important issues. That was at a time when it was very apparent to astute observers that another economic wrecking ball of massive proportions was headed towards the global economy. Uh, and uh, so it's now unfolded. So we need to remember that there are many challenges, almost a bewildering array of them. And amongst those is the need to make certain that we are much better prepared for future potential pandemics. We're not through this one yet. It looks as though you've got an ugly re-emergence of numbers reporting with COVID in Europe. Uh, there are many countries in the developing world where it's hard for us to have a full understanding of how serious the problem is. A friend of mine the other day was talking about Nairobi in Kenya, and he's deep concerned that if it really became a problem there, half the population of Nairobi effectively live in slums and would find it hard to socially distance and half depend on day labour payments to feed their families. And he commented that he had a real fear that if this thing got away in that city, starvation might be a greater cause of death than the actual disease. So we need to be aware of the number of challenges that confront us at any given time, and not just focused on one, lest we get knocked right off guard, 
We need to be aware that we were not as well prepared globally as we should have been for this one. We need to be aware that animal to human transition uh, of um, diseases, uh, is, it runs at quite high levels, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's at a level now that really should be heightening concerns. We need to be aware of the extraordinary way in which health, uh, environment and agricultural production are intricately interwoven. And that's the need, I think, for a one health approach. We need to be aware of the, the extraordinary way in which the explosion in international travel now suddenly brought to an end, by the way, uh, for the time being at least, but also in trade uh, and environmental shifts uh, loss of habitat and so forth for animals, uh, given the importance of recognising that animals can transmit diseases and so forth, um, requires a more dedicated and sophisticated approach. And I think my key message out of this would be twofold. The first is we're under-emphasising the importance of ongoing agricultural research. We know we're undergraduating research scientists in agriculture around the world. And we know too that many who do graduate don't go on to work in this area because of poor returns and what have you. And yet if we're to continue the progress that was, has been made in the past, we will need to employ them better. If we are to be properly prepared to deal with the wash up from this pandemic and prepare for future ones, we need to pay more attention. So just a couple of pointers. Uh, vigilance is extraordinarily important. Um, for Australia's point of view, uh, clean green image, if I can just go there for a moment. It's not just human diseases like COVID-19 uh, that we have to worry about. It's African swine fever. It's um, um, the uh, army worm problem um, that's spread across uh, many parts of the world. Panama disease of bananas, uh, they all pose critical risks to our agricultural prosperity and to our food security. Uh, we need to remember that national budgets will be strained. So we need to try and ensure that in this country and in other countries around the world, we not only recognise the importance of agricultural research, but we make certain that it has adequate funding uh, and we need to continue the drive to improve the nutritional outcome globally. Health is plainly intricately linked to diet uh, and health is also therefore linked, should be remembered, I think, to, to uh, people's ability to cope uh, with illnesses of the sort that we're experiencing at the moment. So the One Health approach, I think, is, is important. Think of it as collaborative, as interdisciplinary, uh, as coordination, as common sense, uh, and as lining up uh, the ducks in a coordinated way. Uh, future threats are likely. We need to be better prepared. They may emerge overseas and then come here. Uh, but our expertise can play a major role. And I do think, uh, again, if I can just conclude, uh, I am not a scientist. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the extraordinary expertise and dedication of our ag scientists and the people who support them and deploy their skills around the world, which is what we try and do uh, at Crawford. But it's very important, this is really important to recognise in this country when people are often in tight times inclined to say charity begins at home. If we are going to be clever, we will recognise that having our frontline scientists helping people in other countries and in other societies and other environments is not only good from a humanitarian point of view, it's just simply smart and strategic for us as well so that we understand what might be coming to us. For example, African swine fever, uh, it is moving towards Australia. We've got people out in the front line who will understand better how it works, how it's transmitted, how we might cope as it comes closer, how we might seek to prevent it coming here. So um, one of the things that I just think is tragically overlooked is the need for cooperation in everyone's interests. We benefit when we seek to make our expertise, whether it's in the form of aid uh, or in any other shape or form uh, to uh, uh, others overseas. Uh, and it goes over and above the humanitarian uh, aspects of it. Finally, I would say this, given that it's an area that Australia is very strong in, I think we should focus on it more, not less, 
and in terms of what we seek to do internationally. And I particularly pay tribute again to ACO, a body I have a huge respect for. So Bryce, I hope those are some useful sort of scene setting remarks. Yes, very good. Um, uh, excellent uh, sort of overview, if you like, of the, the problems that we face. Um, I just want to remind everybody that um, while our guests are talking, you are most welcome to pose your questions using the Q&A um, function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and of course, we have the upvote function. So you can, um, if you see a question you like, click on the little thumbs up um, and the most popular questions will rise to the top of the pile where I can choose to answer them or not. Um, <laughs> uh, next, however, we have uh, Stephanie Williams. Stephanie, you're on mute. Uh, could you? Yep, there we go. Great. Thanks, Bryce. And um, I just start by saying I'm on Ngunnawal land and I acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders with us in the audience today. Thank you to the Crawford Fund and the AIA for bringing us together on this important topic at a really important and topical time. And John, your, your opening remarks about us in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic and a huge global health challenge, not displacing multiple competing priorities, a, fi a fiscal cliff in national budgets and, and really a call to action to resist the, the um, temptation to be looking inward and recognising that looking outward and cooperating um, during crisis is as essential as ever. Um, my role as the ambassador for regional health security is um, ensuring the expertise that we have in health and medical research is used not just for the benefit of Australia, but is deployed for the good of the region. Um, and it also, I also have a role in, in the oversight and implementation of the Australian government's $300 million Indo-Pacific Health Security Initiative, which is administered by the Centre for Health Security, conveniently um, logoed behind me there for recognition. And that's an um, a initiative within the aid program to build capacity to prevent, detect and respond to infectious diseases um, in the region and to contribute to global efforts. So on topic for today, tonight I want to just do two things. The first is to briefly describe the Centre for Health Security and use a current project example to demonstrate how we are already taking the One Health approach of working across the animal, human and environmental interface. And second, to reflect on um, why One Health remains as critical in the setting of COVID and how we have pivoted um, as well to respond um, to particular threats in COVID from a One Health perspective. So on the first point, the Centre for Health Security, as I said, is, administers the government's $300 million initiative between 2017 and 2022. It's our third birthday in a couple of weeks. And we invest in research, capacity building and regional and global partnerships, all focused on contributions to the reduction of risk posed by epidemic endemic and emerging health security threats. We are focused on the risks to humans. We are focused in the Indo-Pacific, but as part of that portfolio, we have 12 One Health project or partnerships in 11 countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Supporting the implementation on, a, on the technical reference group, we have Australian experts guiding the implementation. Four of the eight members have One Health expertise. And in our implementation as a whole of government initiative, we have to operationalize the center secondments from across the APS, including from Department of Agriculture um, and from ACIA. And I'm forever being educated by, my, by our resident in-house vets on keeping the One Health focus really upfront which is a principle which we've had in the design and implementation of the initiative since the beginning. Because we recognise, as we will say many times tonight, and as we will say many times in the future, that our health is intimately connected with the health of our environment and health of animals. Um, and to mitigate risks to health requires deep understanding of all of those sectors so that the actions that we support um, are effective. So the example of a, of a current initiative that the centre funds um, is at the interface of human, animal and environmental sectors is called the WISH project, which is Watershed Interventions for Systems Health. It's running in Fiji. It's led by Joel Negan at the University of Sydney with multiple partners. And if any of them are on the call tonight, I'm sure they will pipe up in question time. 
they are looking on the on the basis that waterborne diseases contribute to 20 percent or so of the global burden of disease um, and in Fiji in particular, leptospirosis, dengue and typhoid, which they refer to as the three plagues, um, remain important human health problems. What the WISH team are doing through a multidisciplinary partnership is asking through an action research approach is whether focusing interventions to improve water quality, but by starting around a watershed um, and making use of the multiple uses of a geographic um, feature of a, of a piece of, of land as it relates to water bound by a ridge with a, a, with a river flowing into a river. And, and in doing so, can you get better understanding of what interventions will, be, will work and be locally owned with the ultimate goal of improving water quality and the consequent flow on effects to both health and health of humans and the environment. And it's a complex project, but very simply what they've done in, on five distinct areas or are doing, working with 28 rural communities is testing water quality before, developing over time community owned solutions, which could be toilets or sediment socks, uh, different infrastructure fencing and testing the water quality after. And they're midway through this project. Um, but what is as important as the, um, the topic is the how and the real engagement across the sectors and taking a social science and understanding what the incentives and the um, disincentives for improving water quality in and around certain areas are. And it's a practical example of research working at the interface. We were very pleased through that investment from the centre, which was around $2 million, to have already leveraged another $7.5 million from partners, other global health partners, such as the recognition of the importance of these types of interventions for, for change. The second thing I wanted to do tonight is just reflect a little bit on COVID and what it means not only reaffirming our um, investment and our approach to One Health, but a practical example of how we have pivoted a small, uh, a really small bit of funding on an important project in the region. So the history of coronavirus um, point to the emergence of this pandemic as a zoonotic spillover event. And I acknowledge the investigations are ongoing to the emergence of this particular pandemic, but we recognise, as John flagged, that such zoonotic spillover events will continue to occur. The drivers of risk are still there. Humans, animals encroaching on each other's habitat, trade, be it legal or illegal in wildlife and animals, different land use and agricultural practices. So we recognise the continued importance of supporting practical action to mitigate those risks. And the issue of wildlife wet markets have come into sharp focus in the setting of the COVID pandemic. Now, those of you who've worked in this sector for a long time is, all, is, is not entirely new. The, the, um, the focus on avian influenza as a potential pandemic threat over the last two decades and the constant work at the human and animal interface on chickens and bird flu, um, where, which, which had focused previously on risk mitigation at livestock markets, seeing them as a hotspot of disease risk. The animals are stressed, there's lots of them, they're coming from different places, and there's lots of humans. Now, during this COVID pandemic, with an existing relationship that the Centre for Health Security has with the Food and Agricultural Organisation, we've committed to a small pilot study to really focus in on whether there are additional risks and actions in specific wildlife wet markets in Indonesia. Um, and that's working with FAO and 11 different stakeholders, institutional stakeholders in Indonesia, um, really to pilot an existing tool in another context around what are the actions um, that we need to do to mitigate all the potential risks along a value chain in a wildlife wet market trade. Focused again on a desire to not use potentially blunt instruments like closure of such markets when there may be other opportunities to, to mitigate risk in a, in a, in a way that doesn't shift trade underground per se, but engages with the real and modifiable risks in those settings. There are several streams of work on this issue. I wanted to bring it up as a, an example of having a, um, a Centre for Health Security with existing partnerships with key organisations has enabled um, very topical responses to um, this during the COVID pandemic.
So I've given a very brief overview of the Centre for Health Security and two examples of what we funded to demonstrate really that we're taking a one health approach. It is worth stepping back just a, a fraction um, and recognising that through the Centre for Health Security, but also DFAT and the Australian response to the COVID pandemic through the development program has seen the pivoting of $280 million worth of assistance to our region for the immediate health social and economic responses. It is a health challenge of our time. There's no question that our response remains very focused on ensuring that we can cooperate in our region, mitigate the impacts of this pandemic, and that we are really definitely in it for the long haul, as is evidenced by the recently released Partnerships for Recovery Development Policy, which puts health security as one of three pillars alongside stability and economic recovery. That's it from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So let's uh, move to Anna from the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Thanks, Bryce. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and potentially good morning to some of you here on the line. Um, and many thanks to the Australian Institute of International Affairs and the Crawford Fund for the invitation to speak to you all today. I wish to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. As we have just heard from the previous two speakers, it's clear that Australia has much to offer in terms of lessons, leadership and scientific expertise on a range of aspects concerning food security, biosecurity and health security. I want to expand a little more on the space at the intersection of these three things, the One Health approach, through first speaking a little on starting with the global perspective of One Health and some of the things that have happened in the, in the last 20 years or so, before giving some examples of how the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research has been contributing to this area in recent years. Quickly, for those of you who may not be so familiar with ACR, we are a statutory authority within the Australian Government's Foreign Aid Program. For almost 40 years, ACR has funded research for development partnerships between Australian research institutions, industry bodies and government agencies and those in our partner countries to better understand the linkages between food production, environmental management and human and animal health outcomes in low middle income countries in our region. One Health, as John and, and Steph have just described, has been gaining traction since the beginning of the 21st century. Building on the centuries old acknowledgement of the inherent linkages between human medicine and veterinary medicine, inclusion of the environmental perspective in what was previously known as this concept of one medicine up until the early 2000s, resulted in the launch of One Health at a joint conference uh, hosted by the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Rockefeller Foundation in 2004. Throughout the 2000s, One Health, as the others have mentioned, really enjoyed a time of growing political and funding support, largely as a result of sequential scares from NEPA virus, SARS, and H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza. This political traction at the global level was evidenced by the establishment of the WHO, FAO, OIE tripartite, and supported by a series of interministerial conferences and high level technical meetings to discuss the value of a One Health approach to addressing diseases of pandemic potential, framed under what was largely a global health security narrative at the time. From a global health governance perspective, key questions were being asked around that time of the sustainability of One Health beyond the tail end of, of avian influenza. Essentially, how could we move One Health from being what, was, what everyone agrees is a good idea to being this fundamental shift in resource allocation towards more integrated, cross-sectoral public health and food security policies and programs, both within and beyond national borders. So flash forward to 2020 and where are we at with One Health? Importantly, I think it's, it's good to unpack a little bit about what has been the experiences and contribution of the Australian aid program to this global movement. And I want to spend a couple of minutes stepping through some examples of where Australia, through ACR, has contributed to furthering the global knowledge capacity and partnerships around One Health. One of the largest ongoing challenges in the area of One Health operationalisation is really this need to demonstrate the added value of working in a One Health space. So simply, One Health does not just mean sectors working together for the sake of it. 
there must be really strategic reasoning for doing so, supported by contributions of time, resources, and or personnel from all partners and based around, for example, commonly shared mandates, potential evidence of cost savings or shared principles and outcomes that justify the additional effort, time and resources required to work across sectors and disciplines. I'm sure for anyone on the line that has been involved in either setting up, implementing or even monitoring and evaluating One Health projects and programs, you will all agree that, that there really is an investment of time, both at the beginning and throughout, throughout the, the process, that, that needs to be justified. And so I think this is one of the things with, with One Health, the value addition needs to be there before it can actually be called a One Health program. So whilst the concept of integrated interventions for disease control is not new, there has been increasing calls to refine, refine existing economic methodologies that better demonstrate the value addition of cross-sectoral working under One Health. And these calls have really ramped up in the last 10 years or so, as people realise that, that it is quite um, time and, and resource consuming to work across sectors. Partly in response to this, an ACR project in Lao PDR from 2010 to 2015 was one of the first examples globally to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of an integrated human animal intervention in Asia. The project was originally set up to address an abnormally high prevalence of the zoonotic parasite Tenia solium in the highlands regions of northern Laos. Tenia solium is a neglected tropical disease. It's the number one cause of acquired epilepsy in low and middle income countries and is also FAO's top ranked foodborne parasite of global importance. However, the Tenia solium intervention run under this One Health program was different to others that had occurred before it in Latin America and in Africa in that it incorporated also the control of priority diseases for both the Lao Ministry of Health, which was saw transmitted helmets, and the Department of Livestock and Fisheries. So a disease called classical swine fever, which is a disease of trade for pigs across large parts of Southeast Asia and other countries. Incorporating these additional diseases into the Tenia Solium intervention was an important first step in addressing what I mentioned before about the increased need for relevance for each of these sectors to be involved in, in some sort of intervention. A well-known WHO metric of cost effectiveness, normally used for human health disease control interventions, was then adapted and applied to the program in order to demonstrate the cost savings to each sector that could be realised through this type of intersectoral, interdisciplinary approach to address both zoonotic and non-zoonotic diseases through a single intervention. Interestingly, from the livestock perspective, inclusion of livestock production parameters in what was essentially a human disease control program was found really to be a key contributor to the economic gains, particularly those felt within the participating communities, given the social and economic importance of pigs in this part of the world. Another example of uh, ACR's important contribution to food security under One Health is in the area of food safety, uh, particularly within traditional, informal, or, or what is often known as wet markets, um, that, that Stephanie's also alluded to. So food safety, as we know, is an integral part of food security and human health. However, to date, research into food safety issues in low middle income countries has often not been afforded the same levels of focus or investment compared to questions around food sufficiency and increasingly nutrition. For the last 10 years, an ACR funded partnership between the International Livestock Research Institute, the Hanoi University of Public Health and the Vietnam National University of Agriculture has focused around food safety aspects of Vietnam's informal pork sector. Pork was chosen as the focus commodity of this program of research, given its popularity as both a protein source and its essential contribution to nutrition and livelihoods in Vietnam. Building on initial work around understanding incentives and importantly gendered aspects of risk mitigation strategies in wet markets, the team has now developed a food safety performance tool that provides governments and industry with a standardised assessment of food safety risk along wet market value chains within this sort of broader analytical framework of business performance considerations and supply chain governance, which are also really important aspects of disease mitigation in wet markets. A third pillar of the tool builds in broader societal concerns and perceptions of risk into this risk analysis framework. This latter phase is really important as it includes consideration of gender, equity and cultural norms, which can either be enhanced or potentially disadvantaged through interventions aimed at addressing risk. For example, certification, regulation, skills upgrading, or even as Steph has mentioned, market closure. This paradigm shift from traditional hazard-based approaches towards food safety 
the more holistic assessment of the risk will hopefully encourage increased efforts and investment to better understand and mitigate the burden of foodborne illness in a range of agricultural value chains and market typologies across many other low middle income countries. In this way, this 10 year research program aims to catalyze private sector and consumer leadership, which is really important to complement and support strengthen national regulatory systems. We know partnerships and trust are an integral component of One Health success. So notwithstanding the excellent science in this work over the last 10 years, this program of work is also a long-standing example of a multi-sectoral interdisciplinary partnership at the interface of food systems and public health, and it's gained significant traction and policy support in Vietnam. The last example I want to touch upon is linked to a recognised need for better understanding of cross-sectoral policy development and funding processes for One Health implementation. Understanding the differing mandates, motivations and policy practices and processes of various actor networks with a stake in One Health governance has been a common theme in ACR supported projects in recent years. At least from my perspective of managing ACR's livestock systems research program over the last couple of years, there appears to be a steadily building body of evidence that demonstrates the appetite of agricultural departments and small medium livestock enterprises in low and middle income countries to work more closely with the public health authorities in, in these places. This appears to be largely due to the increasingly recognised linkages between agri-food systems and broader environmental health and livelihoods outcomes that can be optimised through more holistic approaches to agricultural development and food production, ultimately contributing to improved economic resilience and health security in our broader region. More recently, through a co-funded partnership with the DFATS Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security since 2018, ACR has managed a suite of social, economic and policy research projects aiming to further explore these linkages through a program of work to address important regional health security issues such as antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic vector-borne disease and veterinary system strengthening, all of which aim to contribute new thinking around particularly policy processes, incentives and investment frameworks to better support One Health's operationalisation through this regional public resilience. So in conclusion, since the end of the 21st century, we have seen this evolution of One Health thinking. Charlie, could you unmute it? Hardly <laughs> defined view of zoonotic disease mitigation, yes, largely in the context of emerging infectious disease response, to an approach through which to address a much broader range of 21st century challenges to human health and wellbeing. So these challenges range from sustainable ecosystem services to food and nutritional security, poverty alleviation and fair trade, and more recently, non-communicable disease, as reflected in the recently published working framework of the Lancet One Health Commission. Australia is a world leader in biosecurity, and ACR, as Australia's specialist international agricultural research agency, has used our well-established regional partnerships to understand and address threats to food security and livelihoods, which are, of course, inherently linked to health security under One Health. Put simply, our agri-food systems are at the coalface between human, animal and environmental health. Australia's agricultural innovation system clearly has much to offer in terms of its contribution to the international collective action required to better address issues at the human animal ecosystem interface, both in the relatively short term as the world emerges from COVID-19, but, but more importantly into the future. So it's been a pleasure to share with you some of the experiences of ACR this evening and thank you very much everyone. Thank you very much, Anna. Now, um, my first question on the first question from the Q&A that I'm going to ask is for Stephanie. It's from Colin Chartres. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but he, uh, just to remind everyone, is the CEO of the Crawford Fund, which is tonight's uh, co-badge participant. Um, Colin asks, I do like the watershed health model described by Stephanie, as well as the direct linkages between water bodies, irrigation, pollution and disease vectors like mosquitoes. There may be other environmental, animal, human interact interaction factors that raise or diminish human health risks. His question is, has anyone done any landscape slash watershed risk assessments that try to determine the, these risks? And if so, have they been successful? Thanks, Colin, for the question. And certainly when we saw this as from the Centre for Health Security, it felt like a, a novel approach to multiple complex problems. Um, and as I'm talking, I wonder if there's anyone from the WISH project somewhere on the line who can come up and with the more more recent up-to-date view of 
has anyone else done what they're doing? It certainly seemed novel for us as a funder of transdisciplinary research in the Pacific. And I think in a way, we understand all of these things in separate boxes. So the, the impact, as you say, on water and its interaction with different pathogens and different disease risks is known at sort of population and individual level in health. But what was new for us in looking at this particular intervention was how place-based it was, how we're not looking to solve leptospirosis incidents in Fiji writ large, nor are we looking to improve water quality in Fiji writ large. We're looking very locally at the intersection and I hope we learn from this. Um, and what I will do is um, connect with Joel Negan, who runs the project to come to a more specific answer to your actual question, which is what are the other risk assessments saying? So that's just a start. Right. So um, I'm going to go to the next question and we can open it up to everybody. I think it might be in Anna's uh, court um, and it relates to the, um, the incap in in <coughs> incompatibility, I guess, uh, of the nation state with agriculture to some degree. Um, the transboundary movement of livestock and humans across, <clears throat> excuse me, across porous national borders is a significant threat to controlling animal and human diseases. National borders cut across traditional homelands across the world. How can governments control zoonotic diseases while not impinging on the cultural life of ethnic groups for whom pastoralism is a crucial way of life, such as the cattle keeping pastoralist Fulani, uh, whose traditional homeland spans across 17 countries in West Africa. Um, and that question is from Sava Sinai Mamegani um, in Queensland. I can start off if you like, Bryce. So thank you very much. Absolutely a, a great question. And certainly um, as anyone that's worked in this space, particularly in pastoralist regions, we will understand that, that you know, movement of livestock across borders um, is, is really a challenging, a challenging space for governments who are trying to not only control disease, but really think about what are the reasons behind these diseases need to be controlled. And this is largely, for example, from Australia's perspective, from a trade perspective. So I think um, certainly there's been a lot more um, thinking around these types of regions uh, in, in Africa, for example, I can speak about that. I did my PhD in, in northern Nigeria with the Fulani. And certainly in that period, in, um, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, discussion around how do you control disease across borders? How do you control diseases in, in communities that are sort of far away from, from services and, and, you know, focal points of disease inspection, for example? And I think, I think the, the problem is certainly multifaceted, but but one, one thing that's growing uh, sort of in, in recognition, I think, in particularly in recent years, is the understanding of more regional trade blocks. So instead of national, particularly in Africa, instead of national countries having to control disease, thinking about who their trade partners are, what the objectives are for trade, and, and where do countries have similar biosecurity statuses, and animal disease status, that could potentially trade with each other. So I think these sorts of things, you're seeing the development of Africa's free trade agreement, for example, are really interesting um, ways in which we can start to think a bit more holistically around disease control in animals and, and how that links to disease in humans. Um, the other thing I probably will mention as well is that, you know, it's really interesting, a lot of these pastoralist communities in particular have very strong sense of local governance mechanisms and local support mechanisms. And there's very strong, you know, traditional methods of controlling disease, conditional me methods of quarantine and all these sorts of things that that really, you know, needs to be acknowledged and, and known about a bit better, I think, because there's some really excellent examples of, of ways that communities actually control disease and their understanding of how diseases are controlled both in animals and in humans that we really need to bring out a little bit and, and in, in build into the broader policy conversations. So really good question. I don't think there's an answer to it, but, but certainly uh, people have been thinking in this space and it'll be interesting to see where this goes in the future as value chains become more formalised, particularly in livestock. All right, Stephanie or John, do either of you want to try and answer that unanswerable question? <laughs> I think we had, I just want to make the general point that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, it, it is difficult and we have to try and see it as a challenge rather than an impossibility uh, because 
I don't think you'll ever slow those movements. COVID has to some extent, but long term, I don't think that's a realistic prospect. So it just, to me, it underscores the need to ensure that we're multidisciplinary, if I can put it that way, not just focused on the challenge of the moment. And that's hard to do in a social media age because we flip flop so rapid, rapidly and so readily uh, on, on, on major concerns. We need to stay focused. We need to prioritize this area. We need to ensure it's not lost in the weeds according to the dictates uh, of, of this extraordinary way in which uh, issues now flare, die, flare, and often miss the really important issues that are happening around us. Good. Stephanie, are you uh, you're all right? Okay. Uh if you want to. Um, okay. Uh, well, well, let's, um, let's go to John with um, a question that's probably um, up his alley. Um, pro professional agriculture does not have a good image, says Robert Edgar. Um, he notes the example of his Rotary Club offering a generous scholarship last year for the study of agriculture at university and only receiving one application, although it was an excellent one, he says. Um, from five secondary schools in the regional city of Bendigo. Um, however, there are an estimated 200 professional agriculturalists working in town. What's the problem? Um, why, uh, what steps can, can be taken to overcome um, barriers to, uh, to, to the attractiveness of agri agriculture as a field of study, if you like? Can you just uh, just reiterate that for me? The, the, the question is really about um, promoting agriculture as a uh, as an attractive field of study. Our questioner Robert Edgar says that um, mm -hmm. he put forward a scholarship last year, and there were very few takers uh, uh, for it, even though he lives in a regional area with um, an estimated two hundred professional agriculturalists working. Yeah. In town. How do we make it more attractive? Yeah, look, it's a real issue. Uh, if you'll forgive me a personal indulgence, my son and daughter-in-law are both agricultural scientists uh, with four-year degrees behind them, and neither of them are working in research. Um, uh, neither of them regret doing their courses, uh, but they've just chosen to work in other areas, I think partly because the remuneration is not terribly uh, uh, attractive for people starting out. Although, having said that, my two... Uh, farming themselves, probably lower remuneration. Um, I think this is quite a conundrum. We really are undergraduating a lot. There's not the interest there ought to be. There aren't the jobs there at the end. And yet COVID itself shows that we need to step up the effort. So it's part of the reason why uh, I try every year very hard to enthuse young people. I don't take any credit for this. Uh, but uh, Crawford runs an annual conference. We have you know, classes for, uh, we invite large numbers of young scientists along now, ag scientists, and I have a great privilege of addressing them every year. And I try and say to them, what you're doing is so important, but we need pull as well from governments, from research organizations in the private sector. Uh, and for want of a better word, I suppose a raising in the standing based on an, a better understanding of the importance of agricultural research. That is not a complete answer. I can only say I sympathise entirely with the questioner. It must have been puzzling to do a good thing like that and not see a massive you know, enthusiastic swamping uh, of people uh, wanting to obtain it. Uh, and yet I'm not surprised because it is a very real problem. So, um, uh, you know, I take every opportunity, I can only say that, to emphasize to uh, the government of the day uh, and to anybody else who will listen that this area is incredibly important and Australia punches above its weight, but we can do a lot more. We really can do more uh, and we ought to be recognizing that. It ought to be an area which is glamorized is the wrong word, but held up as one of those areas where you can make a tremendous and invaluable contribution to your fellow human beings. I, uh, and I really do quite passionately believe that. Great. Uh, do either of uh, the, uh, either Anna or Stephanie, do you want <clears> to uh, <throat> take a shot at that? Anna, what attracted you to uh, the career that you have? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think, I think it's a really, it's a really good question. And, and I would actually echo what John has said. Uh, 
you know, the work of the Crawford Fund and, and oh, sorry, my lights have just gone out at work. The Crawford Fund and, and the work of ACR as well in, in trying to encourage um, particularly, you know, undergraduates and, and young researchers and also young farmers into this work in, in at least in the international agricultural space. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. And, and I just think, you know, with growing importance, growing recognition of, of food security and, and food systems, possibly COVID may lead to a pivot in attitudes around the importance of food security and bring more people and make them more interested in agriculture. And certainly just to highlight, I guess it's not, it's not just an Australian issue. We, we're seeing this in a lot of the countries in which we work. And a lot of the thinking ACR does is how do we get more people into agriculture. You know, there's huge numbers of youths in some of the countries that we work in. And, you know, this sort of urban migration because people are leaving rural areas and, and looking for work in cities and not interested in staying on the farm is, is directly reflected here in, in you know, some of the, the situations we have in Australia as well. So certainly a global issue and um, maybe COVID will see a bit of a shift in, in uh, perspective and, and value of our agri-food systems. Great. Um, okay, we, we, we'll go to Mark Shipp now, who, um, as we pointed out at the beginning of the, uh, the webinar, is the Chief Vet Veterinary Officer of Australia. Um, so the title of the talk today is not only One Health, but One Region. And he's asking, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by One Region? Um, Australia has military, cultural and political ties outside of the region. Um, and we've often been seen as neglecting our region, particularly in the Pacific, uh, treating it as simply a market. Uh, will the China Belt and Road Initiative provide the infrastructure to tie the region together and have it work as a global hub with obvious biosecurity risks? Stephanie, is that one for you? It sounds like it. I mean, I'd go to the premise of the of the question and slightly shift it. There's no question that the government's focus, um, especially through the development program, um, is on the Indo-Pacific region. And the Pacific step up, um, which sees us spend almost a quarter of the $4 billion aid program, I think more, $1.3 billion of the $4 billion aid program in the Pacific, I think is testament to the fact that this is not a region that we neglect. This is a region that we are part of. And the Prime Minister has oft referred to the Pacific family and our security, our relationship, our people to people linked, economic ties and development assistance are, are deeply embedded in the region. Um, and so it really just sort of goes back to the premise of the question to Mark. And I'm not sure, can people talk on this? Is it all only just text? We can't bring their voice. Okay. Um, which is we're not there, where we are there. Well, whether the biosecurity risks are increasing in, in, a, in a setting where we're more connected, um, I think that is a question that we can answer in a whole range of ways. Certainly, we look at the biosecurity risks in the Pacific as very different to Southeast Asia, um, especially as what they represent um, for risk of importation of disease, be it in humans or animals to Australia, and the, the kinds of interventions needed to build stronger systems to mitigate biosecurity risks, no matter um, where the infrastructure initiatives are coming from, which comes back to kind of the one of the core functions of the Centre for Health Security, to bring it just back to the logo in this moment, is that independent of who's working, we are there as a partner, both through the program. Um, and I saw another question on the feed, if you permit me a little bit of lateral um, jumping to, are we doing enough in aid? One of the features of this initiative has been to say, okay, there's money to spend in aid projects and programs, but there are relationships to build and relationships exist between Australia's premier health and medical institutions that that bring benefit in both directions in improving biosecurity. One of the, you know, everybody in Australia will know that the Doherty Institute as they, from their profile on domestic COVID response. They're also a partner from the Centre for Health Security um, funded, but by virtue of their relationships, they have been working hand in hand with counterparts building laboratory capacity to test for COVID, self supporting with additional supplies completely outside of the aid program, but really on the back of the strengths of the relationship that exist already in the Pacific. I'll stop there. I, I'd love to just make a very brief comment, which is that I actually think, to be fair to a, a veterinary officer friend, that he and his colleagues 
in the ag science world and to be and, and with it uh, departments of agriculture and primary industry around the country have been quite well focused here i just think governments and perhaps the population at large and, and i'll say it the media uh, have not always really understood the significance of us focusing on our own region but i think i do think plaudits are due i remember when i was minister for agriculture and we had you know, problems of um, biosecurity, uh, insects and so forth hitting the, this way, the papaya fruit fly, from what, for example, it actually got here. Uh, but the amount of knowledge that was that, that went into monitoring it coming in here, realising it had arrived, and then the coordinated set of arrangements that were there to essentially beat the problem, it really did impress me as the uh, then Minister for Primary Industries at a federal level. There was tremendous cooperation between all levels of government. No one quibbled about putting up their agreed part of the dough. Uh, and it was a remarkable exercise in science uh, and in on the ground action. What is my point out of that? I go back to what I said earlier, we can't be one trick ponies. And we've waited too long to realise just how important the region is. Uh, I think the government deserves credit for having picked up the ball. Uh, and uh, late as it may be, and it is late, but it does seem to be happening. Uh, and the work that you've just told us of and outlined, I think is incredibly important. And just very briefly on the young scientists, I think you'll find it on Crawford's website. If not, you'll find it on johnanderson.net.au. Uh, I had a conversation about an hour long conversation with three brilliant young Australian scientists. And if you want to see three fantastic young people really keen to make a contribution and passionately committed to what they've decided to do. Uh, or if you want to show it to other people, young people, uh, for a bit of inspiration, I think you'll find it very valuable. No credit to me. It's all about them and what they had to say and, and their underlying enthusiasm. Thank you for letting me have a second bite at that one. Great. Um, okay, we have a question here from Martin Jago, who, um, who, and I'll combine it with another one. Um, uh, but it's about the efficacy, efficacy of the way that we are implementing um, One Health concepts and whether or not we're really getting the most out of that approach. Um, uh, it seems that Martin would be uh, advocating or at least asking about um, a more radical approach. Do we need to take, for, do, do we need to, for example, as a number of countries have, establish department of, departments of One Health or even ministries of One Health? And if we could scroll up, um, Phoebe, up at the top, there was another question. Speaking of the Do Doherty Institute, there's uh, somebody here, uh, JP Villanueva, who is asking about um, uh, what methods or research approaches are missing in, uh, in One Health today. I'll throw that over, open to either Anna or Stephanie. I'll suggest Anna starts on this one with decades <laughs> of One Health, and I can back in with a view. And thanks, Steph. Um, yes, excellent questions. Um, I guess I'll start with maybe uh, Martin's first, not that I can answer per se, but I think, I think he raises a really important point that, that when you look at, as I was talking before, around sort of the governance, the global health governance perspective of One Health, certainly from this movement through avian influenza in the 2000s in, into sort of, you know, broader terms and, and broader understanding of potentially the opportunities for One Health in other areas. This was certainly a big discussion at the global level and, and you know, there was some key players, the European Commission, uh, US, US government and, and quite a few other, other people sort of talking about, do we institutionalise One Health and if so, how do we go about doing that? And I, I was at a meeting and it must have been 2011, I think, hosted by CDC in the EU and it was all about One Health governance and, and where do we go and do we create the institution, do we create the journal and and sort of follow along the lines of more the eco health system approach. And at the time, I think the consensus was from, from a lot of people, yes, you know, we, we do need to define One Health. I guess this has been the sticking point for many, many years. What does One Health actually mean? And, and then on the other side, there was, you know, groups of people saying, well, if we do keep it flexible, then, you know, it can sort of evolve and, and move with the times. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I, just, you know, we, I wonder whether by maintaining the flexibility around the concept um, has sort of allowed it to sort of, you know, move and, and still be here sort of 15, 20 years later. 
Um, but it's a really good question. And I do spend quite a bit of time thinking around and you know, linking to the second question, what are the research gaps in particular for One Health implementation, operationalization? And I firmly believe it's more around, you know, these policy aspects, the proof of the value addition, how do we get better economic methodologies that cross, cross barriers and cross sectors in order to demonstrate that value addition to implementing One Health? What are the social contexts that we have to work with? How do we better integrate, you know, social science and, and political science into what are essentially epidemiologically, you know, challenging questions? And I think this is, this is the area, of, at least for me, thinking around and when I think of the program and the types of research that we fund here at ACR, is moving very much into this sorts of broader concepts of policy, economics, social research. Because I think, as I said before, everyone agrees that One Health is a good idea. The challenge has been, and we see it time and time again, and this is a criticism of One Health, is there's lots of pilot projects, there's lots of sort of spot examples, but how do you actually institutionalise it? And how do you get the level of funding commitments, for example, that are required to, to address some of these problems in a really sustainable long-term manner. And the unfortunate reality is that until there's a crisis, you know, people go about their business as usual. So it'll be interesting. I think there, there may be a shift from, from COVID um, in, in perspective around how much money we should be putting into prevention and how much into control and, and whether that sort of balance shifts into the future. But yeah, really good questions and, and really interesting sort of thinking space and something I'm actually really interested in. Well, there is actually, uh, we, we will go to you, Stephanie, but there is actually another uh, question um, around whether we need actual dedicated, um, it's from Navneet Dand, whether we need um, dedicated funding bodies to do One Health research um, or whether we handle it through the current ARC grants and NIH MRC grant system. I mean, do we need more dedicated funding for One Health or, 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 or what? <laughs> I'll, um, I'll just add a couple of comments on Jim, um, Anna's response to Martin's question and come to the research. And just for those of you who see me waving, um, you'll be pleased to know the energy efficiency of uh, department buildings mean that the lights will go off if I'm not moving enough. Um, so I think that it is clearly a role for brave and new ideas in pushing the One Health approach further. I think in complex systems, there's rarely single solutions. We all know that. And there's a real temptation to bureaucratize or processize or institutionalize structures that we hope magic happens from that when in fact, um, often the most, uh, from recent experience and from and, um, the creative solutions and sustainable solutions are often independent of some of those structures. Um, I would agree that there's more work to be done, but certainly over the last decade or so, and it was a question I asked our One Health partners at a Centre for Health Security meeting yesterday. As you go around as research, funded research in health security with a One Health perspective um, in the countries of interest, are you yourself the linkage between these institutions or are you encountering existing structures, One Health committees, One Health bodies, One Health plans for AMR that wouldn't have existed 10 years ago? And I think the answer that we got and certainly the lived experience is that in places, there are structures that work for the context and the time. And, and when you think about trying to be too mesh, you know, I'm, you know, I will uh, declare my human health interest. And it's very difficult, you know, when you're trained totally in human health to be thinking about a world where you're, everything that you do um, has got the intersections with environmental and animal health. But rather, there are some touch points that when you find them, they really catalyze good cooperation. And there are many people I can see, obviously, Mark and Martin and people on the call who know this by living it and practicing it. On the research question, it's a good one, Navneet. Um, full disclosure, Navneet is a funded partner of the Centre for Health Security. Um, my sense is that there are enough uh, institutions that fund research um, that are flexible enough to run dedicated calls for One Health rather than thinking about new structures. But that's just a, a, a one view of that. And Anna and John might have views on the research um, infrastructure in Australia. Over. Great, okay. We have um, a couple of questions here, um, well, about, um, about untapped uh, research. I mean, what fields of research do you think are largely untapped? 
um, and should have more focus that develop, developing countries whose budgets are comparatively smaller would benefit in prioritizing and delving into first. And we have a related question um, on the capacity, I guess, of small economies. So small economies are challenged by food security issues at the macro and micro level. How can they be supported in terms of increased investments in zoonotic disease research and development? That's a policy question, so I'll go to Stephanie, I think. I'm trying to stay very One Health focused in my initial answer, and Anna will have um, very, like, she'll have a, a very good perspective and views on this question too. Untapped, um, if I look at the human health spectrum, where that intersects with animal health is one part of that, Broadly speaking, I think we, you know, you can see that the current call for research and development for COVID technologies, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, the funding gap, the request there is $38 billion. That's come out from the global health organizations in Geneva. Even pre-COVID, we recognized that there was funding gaps in research and development for new technologies for diseases that cause um, more problems in the developing world than in the developed world and to that end funded very important mechanisms product development partnerships which address the market failure there that say actually these are global goods these need multiple sources of finance and these need development partners to take risk to to attempt to improve the product availability to improve cure prevention for neglected diseases. So that is a key area and one that we're investing in and one whose the gap in which has been highlighted with COVID. Um, the other area which probably ties in, nice, in neatly to the topic of this evening is broad systems research in health. We're very good um, at single disease questions. We're very good at a, a handful of similar disease questions and we have, much work to do to improve how we design and fund the health systems research, which go to the really tricky questions on governance, on policy, on human incentives, and how systems function and work in, in developing economies. Um, I'll stop there and hand to Anna. Thanks, Steph. And, you know, I absolutely agree with, with everything Steph's just said. She's raised some really important points around you know, first and foremost, One Health is not a blanket approach that you can just sort of wash over every single country in context and, and say, okay, go forth and, and do One Health. I think it really depends on individual country context, individual priorities as to how they interpret and implement and, and manage, um, you know, disease issues or, or other issues at, at a human animal ecosystem interface. And I think we really you know, as, in as much as global public goods perspective from an economic perspective emphasises a partnership relationship, right? It's not a donor recipient relationship if we are going to have, you know, truly be able to address global public goods. And, and One Health has been proposed as a means in which to do that. And I think COVID is a very good example of how diseases, for example, don't respect national boundaries. But, but I think we do need to be careful in sort of saying, well, you know, this is, this is how we do it here. So this is how someone else needs to do it. And, and really, you know, all of the work that you know, ACR does and, and the Centre for Health Security is doing in this space is really emphasising this partnership approach with our partner countries. So I think that's a really important sort of point to make. In terms of the health system strengthening, I agree, really, you know, this sort of, there's always been this sort of dichotomy, I guess, of differing views in, in global health governance as, you know, the vertical disease approach as opposed to these more horizontal or, or systems approaches to, to health system strengthening. And, and I think one area that the human health system has been very, very good at over the last 30 years or so is this area of sort of health policy systems research, really understanding, you know, the business case for investment into health and, and you know, prioritising diseases. So, for example, through the Global Burden of Disease Initiative. And these have been really important ways that the human health community has been able to prioritise diseases and, and sort of coordinate funding and, and, and you know, political will to address some of these, these issues. And, you know, this is largely how, for example, under the Millennium Development Goals, HIV, AIDS, TB and, and um, malaria were sort of prioritised because that came out of some of these sort of metric understandings of, of priorities. So I think in, in veterinary, in the veterinary side, we, we don't use that approach as much and, and that's for a whole host of reasons. You know, the, the obvious one, I guess, is, is animal disease control. Government departments are interested in controlling disease from a trade perspective, not necessarily from a, a human health perspective. 
And I think that's a really important point of, of differentiation. But I guess some of the thinking that we are doing and, and working with the Centre for Health Security on this is how, how would you take sort of health policy systems research approaches and methodologies, for example, and apply them to, to veterinary services and veterinary settings, just to try and understand, I guess, the, the inherent value of particularly the public goods aspects of veterinary systems and services, which I think are often under underappreciated sometimes and, and the contribution that strong veterinary systems make to public health and, and human, human health outcomes and human economic outcomes. So I think that in terms of an area is something that, that you know, needs to be focused on a little bit more. Um, veterinary systems and services are you know, traditionally a little bit underfunded compared to human health in, in many of the places that we work. And a lot of the thinking is how do we build up the, the value and, and better understand the value that veterinary services contribute in order to have a more balanced approach to health systems strengthening under One Health, which is evidently what's needed. Okay, then, um, I mean, I guess there's a question also as to what sort of technology is needed as well. So Ryan John Pasquale asks, or, um, one, or says that One Health is suggested as a strategy to project, prevent the next pandemic. Uh, what type of technologies will be needed for One Health? Are current technologies enough to respond to this challenge, particularly on disease surveillance and mitigation? What's the role in technology in um, yeah, preventing uh, zoonotic diseases or, or pandemics? I'll start quickly because it's, it's not my diagnostics in particular, it's not really my area of expertise, but I, I think, you know, it's a good point and it's something that has been, um, you know, talked about and thought about. There's been some quite big initiatives around disease surveillance in particularly wildlife um, to try and sort of identify and, and better predict uh, disease, potential diseases of spillovers. So, for example, the USAID had the Emerging Pandemic Threats Program for quite some time, and that was all aimed at, you know, sort of surveillance technologies, development of new technologies, and applying the technologies we've already got in low middle income country settings in order to better understand and, and potentially predict whether diseases are gonna spill over. I think it's, it's a really hard thing to do though, because obviously there's lots and lots of diseases circulating in particularly wildlife and some species of wildlife, which is gonna be the disease that spills over and creates the pandemic. It's, it's actually quite hard to predict that just from surveillance or molecular diagnostics alone, for example. So, you know, like I was talking before around from the, the food safety aspects, the food safety example, surveillance is one thing, but we really do need to take that next step and link with the human health aspects to better understand risk and risk factors and what are the potential behavioural elements, market chain elements, all these other things around product processing and, and development that could potentially increase the risk and cause that disease that fits, sits very nicely in some cases in a wildlife animal somewhere and what would cause that to spill over. So I'll hand over to Steph because I'm sure that she's got more to say on, on that sort of technological aspect. Oh, just to echo your point, Anna, actually, is, it, is that it's humans that use technologies um, and people's interaction with technology can be very successful um, and it doesn't have to be a sophisticated one. And I think of examples of the kind of one of the wash ups from the Ebola crisis in 2016, where there was a real temptation in some um, of the affected West African countries, and I think it was in Sierra Leone, for technology driven solutions to the surveillance problem. Here's a great contact tracing database and a great surveillance database, and, and, and we have a visual technology solution for the problem, which we knew was having to capture the right number of contacts and treat the right number of patients to, to stop transmission. In effect, what was working was a very basic Excel spreadsheet and a person and a team of people connected to their community and connected to the needs for disease control. Of course, these can be improved, but it's a, it's a recurring issue in when we talk about One Health and integrated surveillance. And it's um, I always come back to it um, and the temptation to think, oh, well, we'll be so, it'll be so much easier if we could see in one technology place human diseases, animal diseases, plant diseases, and then magic will happen. We'll have an understanding of the integrated threats. But it's also equally possible that the human who's using the human health infectious disease surveillance database and the human who's using the animal health could get to a more effective identification of a threat across both species by talking. Now, I'm not 
at all discounting the role of some really important technology adaptations to try and drive us into a, a 21st century or, you know, about there's got to be a better way than talking. But I actually don't want to forget the importance of people as users of technologies and people with systems thinking and people with relationships across sectors as the ways in which that will ultimately create the demand for technologies that work in One Health. Okay, well, I wish uh, we could uh, keep going all night, but we have uh, come to our allotted time. Um, uh, and we're going to go a little bit over time, actually. But um, I'd like to thank you um, all for um, a fascinating conversation. Stephanie Williams, Anna Ocalo, and John Anderson. It's been wonderful. Um, and, uh, yeah, we hope uh, to, to perhaps welcome you back here for another talk in a, in a, in a few months on, on similar topics.